Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. Three years ago, the New York Times Magazine asked me to do a story about this researcher, Alberto Costa. He's Brazilian, was researching in the United States as a neuroscientist. His daughter was born with Down syndrome. And he changed his whole field and started researching Down syndrome, uh, found, identified a drug that worked in the mouse model of Down syndrome to correct their ability to learn and did a study in uh, young adults. My attitude when I first heard about it was, this can't be real. This sounds like science fiction. There was that novel, Flowers for Algernon, about a person who then, back then it was called mentally retarded. Now people would say cognitively disabled. And you know he got to, to be a genius and then went back. And I thought, uh, can this really be true? But the research is, is absolutely real. It's published in leading medical journals. And after I did that story, I found myself remembering something that I had kind of tried to put away, uh, that when I was eight years old, I still couldn't read. And I can remember the moment when uh, my teacher, Mrs. Browning, in Whittier School was pointing What's, what's that word? And I looked at it and I said, to he? And she said, no, that's the. And that was the moment that I learned to read the word the, and I can remember where I was sitting and where she was. And three years later, I was a straight A student and something of a teacher's pet. And you know, my writing teacher would say, do whatever you want. I can't tell you what to do. And I always wondered what happened there. And I know that for me, I uh, had started reading Spider-Man comics. And you know, maybe Spider-Man changed my brain. Did Spider-Man make me smarter? So, but I was interested, and I decided to start looking into this research in people without Down syndrome. One thing that uh, I've known is that uh, this notion that intelligence can't change. Although psychologists have really believed that for about 100 years, basically it's accepted dogma in science. That view has also been responsible for a lot of really evil acts. Uh, the whole eugenics movement uh, was really based in part on this idea that, uh, well, these <coughs> mentally deficient people need to be you know, pruned from the human family tree. And uh, in the United States, tens of thousands of people uh, were sterilized against their will, uh, you know, cognitively disabled people. Of course, then that view went back across the Atlantic in the 1930s and turned into the, you know, the, the Nazi uh, extermination of many uh, cognitively disabled people. So because of this ugly view that you can't do anything about your intelligence, I think a lot of uh, popular writers have turned their backs on the notion that intelligence matters. So if this thing is so bad, let's just walk away from it. So you get books like Emotional Intelligence, which say quite rightly that you know, your ability to deal with your emotions and understand and read other people's emotions and respond appropriately, very important. Malcolm Gladwell in Outliers has uh, made uh, the so-called rule of 10,000 hours of work, that if you just do 10,000 hours of practice in your chosen field, you'll be a master of it. You know, hard work is a good thing and uh, Edison said genius is 99% perspiration, and that's, of course, true. Uh, Paul Tuff now, book came out last year in the United States. I'm not sure if you guys have it here yet, uh, How Children Succeed, and uh, that's all about grit and determination. So those are all really important, but what they're kind of saying is that 
All that matters is be nice, work hard, don't give up, and it'll all work out. And that is not my experience in life. I mean, I know that I am a very hard worker, but I also know any, any professional journalist or writer meets people that want to write a book. And they say they're writing, and they're trying, but they're not getting there. And uh, the idea that just because the Beatles practiced hard, why didn't all those other bands that practiced hard make it? They had something special going on. So intelligence does matter. It actually affects people that are more intelligent live longer, which when you hear about these conductors who, I mean, being a conductor is one of the most cognitively challenging things to do in the world, uh, they always seem, when they die, to be like 99 years old. <laughs> So, and intelligence is not just, um, it's got this bad name as if it's just being able to solve a puzzle and do rocket science. Uh, but in, in the real world, it's, it's really how we get through life and how we're able to, yes, being emotionally sensitive is important, but actually people that have more cognitive reserve are better able to control their emotions, which is why when you hear these reports of criminals who did something incredibly stupid and they got caught, and why are all those people in jail? It's because, yeah, it's not just that they're emotionally disturbed, they're, they're cognitively challenged, a lot of these people. So given the importance and that you can't just dismiss it, it's really good that about six years ago, this field of intelligence research was basically saved from the bastards who keep saying you can't do anything. And uh, a new study came out. This was by Susan Yockey and Martin Bushkul. And they found that doing about 20 minutes a day, five days a week for four weeks of working memory tasks, and I'll tell you what that is, uh, raise their fluid intelligence by 40% in 19 days. This was considered uh, a heresy uh, when it came out. You know, I think you could make comparisons to any scientific revolutions. Uh, a lot of the conservatives say, no, uh, how dare you make such a claim. Uh, let me just explain, working memory is this really important thing that psychologists have zoomed in on in the past 15 years. We all know long-term memory is remembering your childhood phone number. Short-term memory is if I say 79402281, most of you can kind of remember it. Working memory is your ability to manipulate these numbers, these words, these ideas, to move them around like cards on a, on a table and turn them over so you don't see it and then bring it back and remember it. This task for working memory that uh, Susan Yockey and Martin Bushkel developed, uh, it was originally just a, a test of your fluid intelligence. It's called the NBAC, and basically it's asking you to remember what was that item that I mentioned N times ago, like X times ago. So if I'm reading a list of letters, and I press this button every time I repeat it from one time ago. So if I say N, L, L, bonk, yeah, you just repeated L. But if you do it two back, it's pretty easy two back. N, A, Q, L, Q, A, L, N, L, N, pretty easy. Uh, three back is where you start going crazy. Let me give this to you. See if you can remember it. I'll raise my hand when I, when I repeat three back. L, Q, N, Q, A, N, L, A, Q, A, L, Q. It starts blowing your mind a bit, especially when you see it on a computer. Most people, when they see this, they just like back away and they don't want to do it because it seems like an impossible task. But it's not impossible. And the big deal is that you get better at it as you practice. And I found 75 published, randomized, peer-reviewed trials 
where they found significant benefits to various forms of cognitive training. And I only found four that found no benefit. So my view was this stuff, there's something there. It can't be nonsense. To test it on myself, I didn't want to just write a book and tell about all these studies. I felt like before I write a book saying you can make yourself smarter, I want to test that. So I did seven things. I did the end back online. There's a site called soakyourhead.com. I joined an exercise boot camp and did it for three and a half months. Uh, I learned to play the lute. Music training, had, there's a good number of studies showing a benefit. Mindfulness meditation, I tried that. Uh, there's, again, studies showing it's a benefit. I gave up after two weeks. I had too much going on. Uh, <laughs> I did one of the commercial services, uh, Lumosity. There's pretty decent evidence that a lot of what they offer, even though it seems like fun and games, it turns out they're really serious about what they're trying to do. The sixth thing I did was I got my brain zapped with electricity. So there's something called transcranial direct current stimulation. And there are so many studies of this. It can improve everything from literally that prob thinking outside the box is actually a psychological test where they show you these dots and you're supposed to try to figure out how to connect them all with uh, just the fewest lines and it requires you to solve it to go outside the box of the lines. So people do that much better if they're getting this transcranial direct current. It's only nine volts of electricity. It's very low dose. You can't even feel it, but uh, there's a lot of studies showing a, an effect. The last thing I did was I took a nicotine patch. There's a lot of studies uh, of basic research into nicotine. Uh, Parkinson's patients are sometimes being given nicotine to help them with their movement disorder. People that are smokers, who were smokers, have half the risk of developing Parkinson's. So there's nicotinic receptors in your brain, and they actually, it's, it's like a fundamental part of your wiring. And uh, apparently, uh, I took the seven milligram dose. You can't, I didn't feel it. I could never, I never felt jazzed. I didn't feel more wide awake, but I did find by the end of the day that I had worked more efficiently. So from all those things, when I got done, I took this Raven's Advanced Progressive Matrices, which is this test of fluid intelligence. And compared to when I started afterward, I was 16% better. So I don't know what that means. Uh, it's it's a, a number on a test. Uh, I felt I wrote a better book. I got along better with my family. And I also found it really felt inspiring and good. And I just felt more alive uh, doing all these things instead of sitting down at 9 o'clock and watching a television show. I was, oh, I got to do the loot now. And I felt like, gee, that, that's what smart people do, isn't it? They sit there at night, and they're playing the lute, and then they play a game of chess, and they're always doing something. So all of these have in common that the thing has to be hard. So if you're just doing your crossword puzzles that you've been doing for 20 years, that's probably that's good. But if you want to get better, you've got to do something that is new and novel and is difficult. It's got to be progressive. So you've got to be, as you get better, it's got to get harder. Um, that's why chess, taking chess instructions can be good. Music instructions can be good. All of these working memory games on the computer get harder as you get better, like the end back. This sounds uh, like pixie dust. Uh, believing makes it happen. It sounds like a Walt Disney movie. But in a very real way, they've even done uh, randomized trials where if you tell a kid that you can make yourself smarter through hard work, they will do better on tests that you give them than kids that you told, uh, intelligence is fixed. And you know, I truly believe that you, you really can make a difference, that uh, we're at the beginning of a, a new field, and uh, there certainly remains a lot left to be learned. The notion 
that uh, we're stuck, I think, is behind us. And there's a lot of excitement to see you know, how can you help children and uh, adults blossom and, and grow.